Hello again everybody, and welcome back to the Underground. So today we've got kind of a very controversial topic. Um, this is something that we've been working on and thinking about for a very, very long time. And um, it's not necessarily a topic that we're covering um, for a, a dire need so much as the fact that um, we're, we're sort of oddly fascinated by these, you know, really unique sort of survival situations and, and um, uh, circumstances that are very, very difficult to, you know, thrive in. Uh, so we've taken a special interest in that over the years, um, and we'll dive into that a little bit later, but also um, due to a few different reasons, um, mostly due to the societal, um, I guess, turmoil is perhaps the way to put it. Um, that has sort of sprung up around, not just around the U.S., but around the world. So we wanted to take a sort of scientific approach, or if, if we can't be, you know, scientists, then maybe we can be historians and kind of, and kind of walk through uh, what is a very, very controversial topic, like I said. And the topic we're going to be covering today is how and, and when to begin thinking about uh, perhaps uh, hiding or or surviving or making it through a, a difficult time um, and you know we're not of course saying that we should go out and start you know hiding people in our attics or anything um, but it is kind of something that's interesting to think about and it's in and, and we haven't seen anybody really talk about this in a sort of other than a reverent way of remembering history, we haven't really seen anybody talk about this topic in a 21st century context. So that's what we're going to try to talk about today. And, you know, of course, when we start talking about this, these are some of the questions that we uh, get. Um, mostly the fact that, you know, when you start talking about um, concealing people or, or supplies or, or caching things inside your home or other places, um, people tend to look at you a little funny. Uh, even people who are, you know, hardcore preppers or, or survivalists or, or even, you know, like some criminal elements tend to look at you a little bit weird if you're a perfectly sane person who's trying to, um, or, or even just thinking about, um, perhaps hiding from the authorities in such a way that's, um, uh, to prevent a, a sort of an atrocity from happening. And we sort of walk that fine line because as we see, we're going to have to talk about some things that aren't necessarily strictly legal. Um, when we think about um, hiding people in our homes, we of course go back to the Anne Frank example. And we must remember that during the time period that that scenario went down, um, we, we must always keep in the back of our mind that you know, Otto Frank and, and, and his family were the criminals in that aspect, and the people that were hunting them down uh, to murder them, they were perfectly within the law. So we're going to, of course, not encourage anybody to do anything illegal, um, and we're not, we're, you know, once again, I can't stress this enough, we're not, you know, encouraging people to be extremely paranoid. Um, but with that caveat, this is an interesting topic to think about. Uh, and it's it's definitely worth talking about in today's society, especially with with everything that's going on. So, um, as a good jumping off point, we we must remember that this is something that the U.S. government excels in, and this is what this image is. Now, I would not expect anyone to recognize this group of barrel-chested freedom fighters. Um, if you did, they were not doing their job correctly. So let's go to another image. And this is the same image uh, of these gentlemen during the 70s and 80s. Uh, no one really knows when this image was taken, um, but once again, they're not really well known. You should not be able to recognize these gentlemen. And that's because these guys were the first uh, um, special forces for the United States military. And now, this was the very beginning of a very special kind of special forces. Uh, when they were first created, they were called Operational Detachments. And these guys were first, uh, were part of this group called the Operational Detachment Alpha. Um, they're still called ODAs today. Uh, so you've probably heard us mention ODAs uh, or, or being on an ODA um, in some of our previous uh, content. But um, 
while, while uh, a lot of people will call these guys, you know, being on an ODA, most people would know them as Green Berets. So these guys were part of the very, very first Green Beret units, and their mission was not to, uh, you know, be inserted behind enemy lines in Vietnam like, you know, a certain John Wayne movie that we all know for sort of bringing forth the popularity of the Green Berets. Their mission was very was one uh, very simple one. And other than standing guard and, you know, performing security functions, their goal, their mission was to, in the event of a Soviet takeover of um, uh, West Germany, they would be able to stay behind, let the Soviet Union and the Soviet troops steamroll through their area and then cause a, a lot of havoc. They would lead the resistance afterwards. They were what we now know as stay behind forces. This concept is not new. Um, this goes back to way before World War II. Um, but I highly suggest you look into this concept yourself because uh, we can't really talk more about uh, stay behind forces and the things we're doing in today's uh, military. Um, because a lot of that stuff is still classified, even though it, it happened a long time ago and is pretty much common knowledge. Um, you're going to have to research that on your own. We may have a separate video on that later, but it's kind of hard for us to talk about uh, sort of stay behind forces and, and things like that. So just know that even though the, the topic we're talking about today seems to be a very, very, very paranoid, very, very last ditch, like, oh, this will never happen type scenario, just be just you know be mindful of the fact that the U.S. military has been training and, and specializing uh, special forces uh, detachments in this exact topic for a very very long time. So that's where we're coming at it from. We're not coming at it from a, a sort of survivalist or prepper uh, um, angle. Um, I know we've said it many many times before, but. Um, I myself uh, is too actual, and I don't think uh, most of the people here associated with the S2 Underground, we don't classify ourselves as being preppers, um, but we do like to be a little bit more prepared um, for things that, uh, that may happen down the line. And, you know, our, our sort of motto here is be an asset, not a liability. So be an asset to your team, be an asset to uh, your neighborhood, your friends, your family. Don't be a liability. So that's where we're coming at it from that. So hopefully that will... I'll put people in the right mindset for what the difficult topic we have to cover today. So this is one of the um, the clinchers. Um, so when we think about an invasion or when we think about a, a, a tyrannical government uh, contemplating something as atrocious as genocide, uh, we have to realize that history is... is um, uh, history has a long memory, right? So we have lots of cases where this is, you know, the case. Everything from Somalia to, you know, Afghanistan when the Taliban took over. You know, Afghanistan used to be a a very, very prominent ski resort, a, you know, a heavily westernized area. Same thing with uh, Iran, uh, you know, Iran. They were a very westernized society, and then a lot of political changes took place, and now they're known, uh, they're very infamous for different reasons. So one of the big questions that we get all the time is, should I leave or, or should I not leave? Like, when do I know when it's right to leave my country? When do I know it's right to egress from my area? And to be honest, the answer is very, very difficult. However, we can say that usually you make the decision way too late to do anything about it anyway. And also, usually it's very, very easy to leave a country that's in strife. Um, like, it's very easy to leave, you know, Rwanda. Like, going back to the Rwanda genocide, it was very, very easy for Europeans to leave that country. Um, even as the genocide was in full swing, it was pretty easy to do, um, to get on that plane out of, out of uh, Kigali to, to, to get back to Europe or the U.S. or wherever. Um, but if you were a refugee... Uh, it's easy to leave the country, just walk out of it because the borders are open. But it's a little bit more difficult to figure out where to stay long term. So the chances are, um, if you ever have the, the the question in your mind of should I leave my nation and flee to another country that's that's more a little bit more stable, you know, should I leave Rwanda in the summer of 1993 or 1994, you know, should I leave in 1993 in the fall before the genocide occurs next spring, next summer? Um, you know, that's uh, hindsight is very easy to make the decisions, but during the time period, it's hard to say. 
And here's the other bigger question. Can it happen in the United States? Because usually when we're talking about leaving a tyrannical country, leaving a dictatorial country, leaving a country where there's an, author, you know, an authoritarian government, a regime that's you know, maybe uh, committing acts of genocide or, or, or you know, something as atrocious as that, or even just discriminating against a, a, a population of, of people, um, can it, should we leave the U.S.? Um, and the answer is, uh, for the most part, that we've determined is no. Uh, the United States is usually, you know, people don't tend to leave the United States because it's too tyrannical. People don't tend to leave the United States because it's, you know, an authoritarian and an authoritarian regime. Um, it's, you know, the United States is sort of the goal to get to. Um, so we don't have an answer for that. Um, and we're not really sure that any of this sort of stuff applies to the United States. You know, we try to uh, talk about various uh, levels of um, of hiding things, and we do have an, an example uh, from the U.S. But the the problem is, is that we just don't know. And this is kind of an intelligence gap that we have. And it's not that we don't lack uh, the, the the gut feeling. It's just that we don't have a good example for this. And, you know, just to kind of hammer it home, we can't mention this by name in the video or else YouTube will flag this and take it down. Um, but obviously right now, uh, the reason that we're even talking about this in the first place is not necessarily this thing that we have here on the screen, but the impacts of it, right? So we're seeing people that are, you know, we hate to say these things out loud because when we say them out loud, it tends to make it sound like we're making this stuff up. And the, the blanket truth, the, the blunt and harsh truth, is that around the United States, people are being arrested for being outside during the wrong time of day. People are having their children taken away from them because they may be sick or they, you know, they refuse to quarantine. People are being arrested left and right for opening up businesses, being in parks, not wearing masks. So you know and and it's not that it's not that it's happening on a, a widespread scale cuz we can't know that like i i can't know how many people are being arrested every day because of this it may just be one or two or maybe one or 2000 but i'm saying that the fact that it's happening at all shows that it's maybe time to start thinking about these things it may not be time to uh start building things like we're going to be talking about here in a minute but it's definitely worth, you know, thinking about. That's all we're trying to do with this video is get people to think um, and sort of share ideas and, and, and spread knowledge right now. Because right now, it may not be the time to go, you know, quit your job and stock up food and hide in your attic for a couple of years. It may not be time for that, but it is definitely the time for learning. And it's definitely the time for thinking, right? So uh, that's why we're sort of talking about this. So... That with that being said, and with that long sort of disclaimer being said, hopefully we haven't turned anybody off. But these are our goals, right? Is to quote, you know, quote unquote, fill the sandbags before the rain, right? Because by the time it starts sprinkling, it's too late to start filling sandbags for the most part. Uh, to stick with the analogy of a flood. Um, but I'll, I'll just read this out for people who may be listening on the podcast. Our our first goal is to to have the capabilities to hold out until societal, political, and economic pressures subside, uh, therefore returning to a more stable period in time. And for this, we want people to think in their mind, you know, think about maintaining operations through prohibition. Think about all those bars and those speakeasies that sort of popped up and maintain operations through prohibition. It was only uh, for a very, very short period of time. But prohibition was such a drastic thing that it literally altered our constitution, right? So people tend to, you know, jump to uh, the, the the Nazi, you know, uh, allegory. But you know, prohibition is is not to be uh, not to be misled either. So that's our first goal, and our second goal is more serious, right? Our second goal is to be immediately prepared to not only be self-sufficient but also to provide aid, shelter, supplies uh, to others in the event of a more serious collapse-like situation. And for this category, we're thinking, you know, thinking about surviving the Rwandan genocide. Um, the Rwandan genocide was a very, very quick event 
when it comes to uh, genocides. Now, granted, it did take many, many months to kill those hundreds of thousands of people. However, the, from the very, very start, right, from the sort of Burundian genocide, which kind of kicked everything off and sort of, uh, you know, uh, allowed the, the Hutus and the Tutsis to develop an animosity towards one another that was even, uh, you, you, that was uh, genocidal in nature, that occurred only, a, you know, a year before the actual genocide. So from you know, like 1990, 1991 until, you know, 1994 when the genocide occurred, that's something, that's a very short time period. That's only a few years. We're not talking about a hundred years of sentiment built up. So that's sort of what we're thinking about. This is going to be a very short term, you know, a couple of years at the very most, and then we'll be back to, or at least a different society. And, you know, when you look at these two goals here, you can sort of build a comparison to, um, what we in the military or what we, you know, intelligence analysts like to use, which is our most likely COA, our most likely course of action, and our most deadly our most or most dangerous course of action, depending on which agency you work for. So your most likely COA is, you know, going to be, you know, prepared for what's most likely, right? But also be prepared for what's the worst case. So be prepared for what's going to happen you know, uh, you know, most often, but also be prepared for the absolute worst case. That's our goal, right? To be kind of prepared for both, or at least be mindful of both. Start thinking about them. So, this leads us to our sort of our system for caches or hideouts, or what you call it. So, there's four main types uh, that we have identified. Now, this is all our own organic research. A lot of people have have been have done research in in different areas, but we've kind of narrowed it down to four things that we think are worth uh, thinking about. And the first one is micro caches. Um, and if we slide this over to the side and we take a look at what microcaches contain, they're going to be for information, right? Microcaches uh, are for things like microfilm from like the 80s when you know, the Soviet spies had these secret coins that they put microfilm inside. Um, but nowadays, we're talking micro SD cards. Micro SD cards can be hidden pretty much everywhere, including inside the human body. So... Um, that's what we say when we mean micro caches. Next up are sort of larger gear caches, and these are going to be for things like food and supplies and gear and other things that are most likely to be banned. You know, if you've got, say, like an ammo box, you know, that's got some ammo in it or, or maybe some, you know, 80% lowers or something like that. You know, that socked away in the bottom of a closet or underneath a floorboard or two. That's what we're talking about when we mean larger gear caches. Now, these obviously can be of any size, but that's the kind of size we're thinking. We're thinking maybe ammo box, maybe foot locker size at the very most. And then the next size up are what we call quick hides. Now, this is an interesting concept we haven't heard anybody talk about really. Um, a quick hide is, is, is basically a coffin. Right, it's a coffin-sized um, hideout that a person can slip into very, very easily and very, very quickly, um, and hide there temporarily. Maybe you know, no more than a couple of hours tops. Right. So we're thinking about things like uh, you know, cool tables that, uh, like a pool table or something that you hit a button and a compartment drops down and you hit a button again and it raises the person gets in and you hit a button and the compartment raises back up and the person's hidden inside the. Uh, the, the pool table. That's the kind of thing we're thinking about with these. And um, these are kind of hard to construct. And you, you, if you're going to build one yourself, it's going to be not easy to do. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then our last category are long-term hides. Now these are every prepper's dream, right? Everybody wants to have a secret bunker or a secret annex, right? Or, or something hidden where you could live inside there for a long period of time and no one would ever know. So if that's what we're going for, when it, that's what may be required in certain circumstances, but um, you know, we'll, go over, we'll go over the pros and cons here in just a second, but you know, suffice it to say, these covert living areas, um, they're not going to be easy to maintain. They're gonna, there's, there's a lot of problems with them, but you also have to remember that they are the most secure and they're able to sustain life in relative comfort for a very long time. So just some examples of micro caches. This is what we have here. Um, now, when you go research these micro caches, you can use any sort of keyword you want. Um, diversion safes are a good uh, a good term to start with, but you have to be mindful. This is kind of where we stray into the legal sort of area. 
um, all of these caches here, like on the on the right side of the screen, um, they uh, <laughs> you can see right here uh, the one on the bottom. Uh, this right here is a diversion safe hairbrush by Stash It brand. Can hide can uh, what does it say? Can safe to hide money, jewelry, or valuables with discreet secret removable lid and bonus smell proof container. So. Obviously, these micro caches, when you go look for them on Amazon, especially on Amazon, they're really meant for one market, and they're trying to sugarcoat it, but basically these caches are meant to hide drugs. Like, that's basically what they're made for. You can call them, like, covert pill containers. This one over here on the right side of the screen, again, is a flashlight that's a quote-unquote discreet pill holder. Yeah, right. It's meant to hold, like, either weed or some kind of pills or something. So <laughs> you have to realize that a lot of times, that's what these are made for. And, you know, I'm not saying that it's, you know, a bad market. I'm just saying that uh, they're not fooling anybody when they're when they're talking about that. So, you you know, possessing these in some areas might might not be the best thing. So just keep that in mind is that, you know, to basically keep your information private, you know, even if you're putting a, a, a micro SD card with your health records on it inside a coin like up here in this micro SD card or inside a bolt right here. Uh, you're going to have to buy things from people who are probably trying to help people conceal drugs. Um, and whatever your feelings are on that, you know, it's kind of irrelevant because the, you know, law enforcement's feelings on that are quite clear is that that's a crime. So just keep that in mind is that you're going to have to sort of buy stuff from stoners on Amazon if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to do that. So with that out of the way, um, here is another concept, and this I want to briefly touch on this because we're going to have a whole separate, probably an hour, maybe two hour long series on just this exact thing. Now, this is uh, not a this is not a picture of my exact one, but this is a I have this exact container. Um, this is my Sear escape capsule, and we will have a whole video on this. So I'm sorry we can't talk about it now because we just don't have enough time. But this is a very very interesting concept that I don't see anyone on the internet talking about, despite the fact that this is kind of a pretty big part of Seer. Um, and you would think that at least some, you know, maybe some bro vets or something who've actually been through like the advanced Seer courses would talk about this, but they don't, which is kind of weird. So, so uh, let's move along now to the sort of larger caches. Now these are like uh, your fake vents, your, uh, my personal favorite are these little um, uh, power outlets like we're, uh, you know, uh, power receptacles in a house that you tilt down with a key and uh, you can put stuff inside. Those are awesome. These little, you know, fake floating shelves that slide open, you can hide stuff in. These are great for things like, you know, like just like here, like <laughs> uh, some, you know, some money, some, you know, passport, maybe a firearm or two, you know. Just look up covert firearm storage and you will find a lot of things like this. Now, a lot of these are quite overpriced, I will admit. Um, and a lot of these you can make yourself for very, very cheaply. Um, but if you want something ready-made, you're going to probably, the, the big market, if you're trying to find something to hide things, uh, go for covert firearm storage. Because if you can hide a firearm, you can usually hide things like stacks of cash, um, you know, information, records, uh, even food or things like that. So um, that's the kind of thing you're going to want to research if you're getting more. And that's really all we're trying to do here is encourage you to do you know, your own research. And then this is sort of like your quick hide type thing. Now this of course costs a lot more money, but you can readily get these products online nowadays. And this is kind of a lifted bed with a storage area underneath. And all you got to do is press a button and it automatically lifts up. And as you can see here in the sales image, they have pillows in there. But why can't you hide a person or two in there? You know, in 30 seconds you could open... Open the bed up, pop a couple people in there, put them back down. There you go. No problem at all. So, and then here is, of course, the coup de grace. This is a, a, a secret area that I think a Dutch family found in their attic um, that was obviously used for some kind of resistance activity during World War II. And, you know, that's just that's just awesome. So, um you know, I would, I would give anything to find one of these in my attic just for the nostalgia factor and then the coolness factor of this. Um, but yeah, once again, these these living areas, covert living areas, are absolutely crucial. And um, yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're not that easy to make, but this is essentially what we're talking about when we say these long-term living areas. And, you know, 
if you think that they don't work, uh, you know, they're hard to build, um, they're not. So this is a very, very easy thing to do. And as you can see, the top right image and the bottom right image uh, show the ubiquitous U.S. military spider hole. Now, this is more for a remote type application, sure, but I think the, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army would prove that you know, over a decade or so, they uh, were quite good at building these. They're very easy to make, and you can hide. You know, somebody can walk within six inches of you and never know you're there. So, now, obviously, we're not talking about building spider holes in our backyard. That would be kind of a ridiculous thing to think about. But if you look on the, uh, the, the upper left-hand corner, that spider hole should be a little bit familiar to a few of you that have been in the military for a little ways. And that's because that's the inside of a very famous spider hole. Uh, and this spider hole was Saddam Hussein's hideout. So this is exactly, or this is an artist rendering before they actually got pictures of uh, what the spider hole looked like. But this is where Saddam Hussein was hiding out after... Uh, we basically uh, won the invasion uh, phase of the operation. So yeah, he had a styrofoam panel. It was a very small spider hole, but it was large enough to have people in there. Uh, he could probably have fit several people in there if he wanted to. Um, but as you can see, the sort of um, schematic isn't exactly how uh, uh, how his spider hole was. But um, yeah, it was kind of uh, kind of an interesting concept that yeah, it does work. And uh, if if he you know the United States had not, if you know, the U.S. analysts had not been on top of their game and had not uh, uh, done the right human stuff, they would not have found him. So um, these types of spider holes and things like that are definitely, definitely useful. Um, though, you know, I don't have any. I don't think anybody here at the ST Underground Project has one of these in their, you know, in, in any of their properties. Um, but it might be something worth thinking about. Hey, if you've got a free summer, you know, and you're willing to try some things out, you know, why not go for it? You know, it's a skill that's not necessarily a bad one to have. So just just, uh, just something to consider on that. And then uh, another example of a more sort of covert hidden living area is this kind of spooky area. And uh, as you can see by the images on the far right-hand side of the screen, this was found by a family who just purchased a house um, uh, in, uh, I think, the London area of the U.K., and uh, they found underneath that uh, underneath that rug there a small grate, which uh, led down a you know a ladder, led down a hole to another door, and they found this underground chapel. And um, they're not entirely sure how old it is. I think they're still trying to work with the local archaeology department to figure it out. But they think, based on what was found in the room, such as the cross on the floor, that it may have been a, uh, a hideout for Christians. Um, during the uh, during uh, one of the conflicts over there, um, I'm not sure exactly which conflict they thought it was, but um, the 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 bunker, so to speak, predated the house by a considerable amount. So it's it's possible that somebody found the land, found that bunker, and uh, built a house over it and it incorporated it right into the house. So that's kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, and as you could see, you, you could live in there for a considerable amount of time. So, you know, this is obviously a, a, a pretty big fantasy list, right? This is something that, you know, not all of us are going to be able to do. Um, but this is far more common. So this is a concept, um, you know, if you, this is another field that you might want to research. And this is, you know, illegal alien smuggling. So uh, it turns out that if you want to figure out how to hide a person, the number one people to turn to in society, and at least in American Western society, is the criminal aspect. Look into human trafficking, especially when it comes to illegal immigration, because um, when it comes to smuggling adults, you know, when it comes to coyote smuggling, you know, people across the border, um, there's a lot of information about that because it happens so often. So. Uh, these couple of guys, they were found uh, smuggling in. They were behind a bumper, as you can see, that was pulled off, but they never would have been found if uh, some x-ray technology had, had not revealed their position. So, um, you know, this is once again a reminder that if you're going to research this stuff, be advised that you're going to have to, you're learning from criminals, right? There's no U.S. government doctrine that's going to tell you how to safely hide in your home. There's no going to be no um, 
like lawful doctrine anywhere or, or any of his history books really that are going to tell you how to you know you know hide cash away or things like that you know the diversion safes those are easy because those are you know they're just diversion safes right but when it comes to hiding a person you're really going to have to turn to criminals to figure out how to do that so be advised when you're researching that you're gonna you know um, you're gonna be under probably some sort of surveillance so I would definitely not google any of this stuff not by a long shot um, and use some of our use some of the uh, techniques that we've talked about in our uh, mass surveillance um, uh, series uh, in our podcast. Uh, use some of that stuff to kind of research this further. But we'll talk about more of that later. Just wanted to kind of bring that up again. That hey, you're going to be researching some stuff that may be illegal to even learn, right? Because so, apparently in the year 2020, forbidden knowledge is 100% a thing. So. Um, moving along to our sort of pros and cons of these different kinds of caches. So as you move down from, as you move, you know, up in size, um, we have, you know, micro caches, uh, sort of how these arrows work is, you know, they show the, the capabilities, right? So, you know, micro caches, you're not going to be able to store anything in them at all. Can, it's maybe a micro SD card. That's it. Um, however, a long-term hide, like a secret compartment in your attic, that's going to be able to hold people. You're going to be able to hold a lot of food, a lot of water, sanitation, uh, all kinds of things in there, right? You can't fit that inside a quarter. You know, you can't fit that inside a chapstick tube or something like that. So you're going to realize that as the size goes up, the capabilities you have also go up. However, the cost also goes up. So the bigger the cash, the more expensive it is. And that's usually a general rule. Um, a lot of these micro caches are pretty cheap. Um, hey, definitely more cheap than uh, you know building a secret compartment in your basement or in your attic or a spider hole somewhere. Um, also, the resources you need to build them are going to go up, and this is important because if you if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're going to try to hide a person in your home. Chances are you didn't build that you didn't build a place to hide a human being beforehand So you're gonna have to have wood you're gonna have to have nails and screws You're gonna have to be able to do it quietly and You're gonna have to be able to do it with minimal supplies and you know the more the, the bigger the place the more resources you're gonna need so You know you might not be able to do that when the time comes um, now, granted, there are ways you can build long-term highs with not that many resources by just taking advantage of, of um, void spaces. That's what we try to do when we're trying to figure out these long-term hide locations is look for the void spaces in a house. Um, and you can take advantage of those, but also be, admi be advised that if you can think of it, uh, you know, law enforcement can think of it too. So that's just something to, once again, be aware of. And then, once again, the social impacts are also what we're thinking about. You know, I don't know about you guys, but if, you know, I were to tell my wife that, uh, hey, honey, this weekend I want to build a, a, a secret compartment in the attic to hold six people, um, I'm going to get a crazy, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get looked at like I'm an insane person. Um it's going to be a, a, a harder sell. You can't tell your neighbors about this sort of thing. You cannot tell your coworkers. You can barely tell your family, right? You can barely tell people that are, you know, only the people that you share a house with can you tell about this sort of thing. And even then, they, you know, it might be a little bit hard to get around socially. Whereas if, you know, if I were to say, hey, look, I want to buy this, you know, fake can of shaving cream that's got a little safe in the bottom. Look, see, I can hide a couple of SD cards in there. Nobody bats an eye because that's a normal thing people do nowadays. You know, people have like, hey, I want to buy a small little lockbox that I can kind of hide in my desk drawer. Sure, that's fine. Nobody, you know, nobody bats an eye. But the second you talk about putting secret compartments in, you know, your house or in your car, um, the social impacts get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more intense. So that's something to keep in mind as well because we can't just ignore that fact. This is a very, very social thing we're talking about here. So. Um, I feel like a lot of people leave that out. They said, like, you know, you know, when when SHTF or when you know when the WROL situation comes around, I'm just gonna slap on all my stuff and go out and blah blah blah. 
well, that's all well and good, but what about your family? You know, are you taking care of them? Are you going to alienate, you know, the little old lady next door? You know, are you going to scare her half to death? You know, so the social impacts of all of this stuff is very, very important. And it's a more of a driving factor, honestly, than it should be in a lot of cases. But we'll talk about that later. So some of the areas, so if we're going to talk about covert living areas, they're going to require a lot of space. And honestly, these are the ones that are harder to research, like I mentioned before. Now, these are some areas that you can research. I'll just read them out right quick for the guys listening to us on the podcast. But um, these are areas that you can research to find more about covert living areas and like residences. First and foremost is obviously the Holocaust. And very, you know, it's well known for um, Jews and other uh, uh, enemies of the Nazi regime hiding out in secret areas. Um, another one is World War II POW escapes, you know, with the French resistance helping people escape, uh, with, with other resistance movements like, you know, through, through Belgium, through, through the, uh, the Netherlands, things like that, and through Poland, especially good grief with the, you know, the, the, the uh, partisan elements there uh, trying to help people escape, good source of research. Another one is, you know, the escape stories from the Rwanda genocide. Uh, also, you know, other conflicts like the First Chechen War, the Bosnian War, um, even the ISIS occupation of Syria and Iraq uh, back from just a few years ago. That's a good source because that was a very much an invasion. Um, also, another good source of research is the religious persecution in China. So for those that are unaware, it's pretty much illegal to go to church as a Christian in China. Um and while I'm not particularly religious myself, I find it very, very interesting to study that sort of thing. Um, because in China, apparently, um, you cannot go to church. The only churches that are authorized are ones that are run, owned, and operated by the communist regime in China. So they have a lot of underground churches. So check that out. That's a very good wealth of information for this sort of thing. Um, another one is uh, Operation Searchlight, which is um, more known by the Bangladesh, Bangladesh genocide, another genocidal uh, action that not a whole lot of people in the West have heard about. So that's something worth looking into as well. Um, also, Taliban doctrine in the early years, right when the Taliban was started starting to seize power and starting to you know hide away in caves and things like that, that's definitely something to research. Um, and then once again, you know, your criminal elements look into, you know, how narcotics traffickers do what they do. Uh, that's a very interesting, you know, a uh, uh, subject area because, you know, we're not like, you know, disclaimer, legal disclaimers aside, we're not trafficking narcotics here. Like, if, you know, the worst thing that we're probably stocking away is probably, you know, ammunition for our personal usage. And of course, all of this is illegal. We're not advocating for doing anything illegal. It's not illegal to hide an SD card with some books on it, you know, in you know, a chapstick tube. That's not illegal at all. Um, but yet there may be a day when it actually becomes illegal. And then, you know, once again, even though it's a kind of a dated excuse or, or not excuse, an example, um, the, the prohibition in the United States, that's a good, uh, good jumping off point. Um, and so we have to remember that with these covert areas, what's the sort of what's the goal here? You know, it, and you know, we're sort of with the covert living areas. Our main goal is to to survive the quote unquote door kick in the night. Um, so you know, a, a, you know, a a raid um, a happening because of a. Uh, um, something or other that you know where people are trying to come into your home from a law enforcement nature and try to arrest somebody for something and you know i know i'm talking around this so i'll give i'll just break down and give you an actual example so in our area it is mandatory right now for any visitors from out of state to self quarantine and if they don't self quarantine they are, they will be arrested it has happened multiple times many people i won't say many people but it's happened a few times right it's documented of people coming in from out of state um them like checking in at a restaurant on facebook which is dumb i know or or using their social media in some way and tagging the city or something and somehow or another the county health department or the city health department finds out they're there they show up and, with the sheriff and they are arrested. So in our area, um, we had some family come in for um, just for, you know, to, to, uh, to do some things with us and they're from out of state. 
and uh, so we had to shelter we had to hide two people in our own home we couldn't we had to you know make sure that when they arrived they arrived after dark so that you know our neighbors didn't see they used the back entrance you know, from the from the uh, sort of back alleyway it's not really an alley but you know from behind the house and uh, yeah they didn't go outside during the daytime and they were you know just there passing through for the most part and stayed a couple of days and uh, yeah, didn't go outside, did not show presence, things like that. So technically, <laughs> we were breaking the law when it came to um, our own family members. But I can tell you that, you know, it, he, I'm not going to turn in my own relatives so that they can get arrested just for surviving, right? Just for living. So that moment right there was when we kind of sealed the deal and said, hey, you know what? Um, we're going to make this, you know, YouTube video, we're going to make this presentation and kind of show people what we're thinking because that scared us, right? Um, you know, I, I, I tend to not necessarily be scared or even surprised by the things that have happened because of this crisis we're going through right now. But I can tell you that, you know, despite seeing a lot of horrific things over my lifetime that, um, right now I, I'm, I'm very, very concerned very very concerned and um, that's why we sort of um, have had to think about these sort of things and you know I you know I, I think that a lot of people uh, maybe I'm just you know reminiscing but I, I think a lot of people tend to prepare for things that that don't necessarily or aren't necessarily gonna happen you know I think that as soon as everybody gets their concealed carry permit then you know as soon as they concealed care for the first time they're picturing in their mind okay what happens if a bad guy comes in this store here you know oh I'm in line you know in the grocery store oh what happens if a bad guy comes in what am I gonna do is this you know and uh, it's very easy to picture these things in your head and for me you know even as a child you know when I was growing up in the Boy Scouts I had a very very morbid fascination with uh, things and survival situations that were extremely rare, like you know how to survive, you know, uh, falling out of a plane with no parachute, you know, some things that you know have no way to survive, but you can do something to improve your chances, you know, how to survive, you know, being adrift at sea with no life raft or anything like that, like you know, it's things that are extremely, extremely rare. Um, and I find that, you know, I, you know, watching The Great Escape, you know, with Steve McQueen, one of my favorite movies of all time, you know, watching that, you know, growing up, you know, I started thinking, okay, well, you know, if I was, you know, in a POW camp, how would I escape? And, you know, it's nothing more than a morbid curiosity, more, nothing more than just something that's interesting. Never really seriously considered this stuff until, you know, my wife comes to me and says, okay, well, what are what are our plans for this? You know what what are we gonna do? Hey, you're supposed to be the guy that's you know prepared for everything, right? Or, you know, if not prepared for everything, you've you know thought about it. This stuff, I know you've thought about it. So, what are we gonna do? So that's sort of you know I hate to digress it on this particular slide, but that's something that I felt like had to be sort of you know conveyed when it comes to the goals for this kind of thing, um, but. Unfortunately, the one of the big things you're going to have to do is just keep moving. Um, we found that you know we can analyze the sort of you know Anne Frank story uh, to death and 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 find out that um, it is very very rare. Um, her family and uh, the the other family that was staying with them. Uh, they stayed in that location for about two years, and that was extremely rare. If you look up the data, you'll find that on average, the Jews that were in hiding in the occupied territories throughout the war stayed in an average of four places throughout the, the time that they were trying to move out of the country, and they certainly didn't try to stay. So keeping uh, keeping on the move is key. But... Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say on, on the sort of covert living areas. Um, and then there are some more considerations to think about um, when it comes to the actual like social impact and things. You're going to have to have gear, right? You're going to have to have supplies. And, you know, in, in today's society, I've said it before on all of our platforms, I'm pretty sure, but it's 2020, and if you don't have a gas mask right now, um, for every member in your family, uh, I don't know what to tell you because that is a requirement now. Um, you know, if I did not have a gas mask, I would probably that was probably be one of the things that I panic bought um, beforehand. Um, 
because nowadays it's it's crucial and you're going to need a gas mask if you're a civilian in 2020 um, because I can tell you with the with the riots going down in Portland right now um, and you know, the sort of summer of violence in 2020 that we've seen and the rise of the use of the gas mask, I can guarantee you that come this fall, some politician is going to try to make gas masks illegal for civilians to own. So that's just a writing on the wall. If you you know if you can't see that, I, I, I you know I, we might have we might uh, explain on that further in a, in an update video with our you know Seaburn stuff. But um, you need a gas mask. You know other things you might need. Just you're gonna have to your normal sort of prepping type supplies. You know food, water, sanitation. Um, but you know skipping over that because that's stuff that other people far more experienced than us have covered. We can talk about the environmental concerns. Most notably, uh, nowadays we have this thing called FLIR. We have this thing called infrared imaging and thermal imaging uh, that can detect void spaces in houses. You've got all kinds of technological devices that if somebody was trying to find you, even in the most sort of, you know, Bruce Wayne type hideout layer, they're going to find you. So uh, everything from, you know, dogs to simple stethoscopes in the walls, they're going to, you know, you're going to be detected if somebody's looking for you. Um, but you know, uh, you also have to worry about things like condensation and, and paint shrinkage. Like for instance, uh, I had one particular area, uh, in, in my house where I had to, uh, take a piece of trim out and I took the piece of trim out and saw there was a pretty big void behind it in the wall. So I said, Hey, let me put something back there. So I put something back there and you know, stock some supplies away, then put the piece of trim back and then painted it shut. Well, a couple of weeks later, I go back to check on it, and lo and behold, the paint had shrunk because of the humidity and the condensation and things like that. So you have to be able to to, to maintain your sort of stuff like that. Um, also, if you live in a very humid area, you've got to remember that if your that if your covert living area is in like an attic, you're going to have to deal with you know the heat. You're going to have to deal with spoil it. You can't store food in an attic for sure. Um, you, you can't really. You can store stuff in basements, of course, but you know we're thinking attics because I probably because I have an attic. I don't, I don't actually have a basement. Um, but yeah, you're gonna have to worry about things like rusting. Like you know, we're here in the coastal, you know, Mid Atlantic region. We're not right on the water, um, but uh, yeah, you know, you know, rusting of, of things like weapons and other metal items, huge thing. And then, of course, there's this thing called the changing of the batteries phenomenon. I'm not sure if that's the doctrinal term. I'm not sure there is a doctrinal term for it. Um, I've seen a few pop culture references to this. But basically, um, it boils down to one simple idea. And it's, and it's the idea that during the height of the Cold War, most spies that were caught by either the Russians or by the United States uh, most spies were caught changing batteries, right? They weren't caught stealing the information, right? They weren't caught um, trying to, you know, subvert something. They weren't caught with, you know, a camera in their hand. They were caught, you know, cha either changing the batteries to their electronic bugs or they were caught uh, going back to a dead drop, something that was supposed to be secure. So that's something to keep in mind as well. In other words, you, you know, you're probably going to get caught entering and exiting your covert living area way more likely to, to for that to happen than it is for you to be caught just simply hiding in it. So something to once again think about. And so this concept is an interesting one, and I, it's something that I don't see nearly enough people do, and it's a very, very important thing. Basically, once again, the idea we're going for is just a little bit of an edge, right? We're not trying to be Jason Bourne and disappear. We're trying to have just a little bit of an edge. So, myself and everybody here at the S2 Underground Project, once they learned uh, this is something I did, um, this is interesting. And this is the I'm not here message. Basically, You've got a kitchen table like here in this image, and you've got a little a pad on the kitchen table, like or, or or even a message on a refrigerator, right? A little cute note, and basically the note says, "Hey, honey, I'm not there. Um, I've gone to Baltimore with the guys for a few days. You know, sorry it's last minute or something like that. And you know, love whoever, right? And then put your actual name there. That way, if somebody has a warrant and they come into your house." And they see, you know, they come into your house, well, you're not there. 
or they come into your house when you know when you're in your hiding spot they will obviously see the note right it wasn't intended for them, at least they think so, but it was intended for them because that note's not real. That note, you and your spouse or you and your family have predetermined, you've left there on purpose. They know it's a fake note, and they leave it there 24-7. And the goal is for anybody who breaks into your house or serves a warrant on your house or enters your house in some way, they'll think you've gone. They won't know you're hiding just a couple of feet away behind a wall or something. So that's an interesting concept I haven't seen anybody do. Now, obviously, the caveat is it's you know it's pretty much free to do. You just gotta have a piece of paper and just leave it in the right spot. That's very easy to do. And you know the caveat is you know once again that you have to prearrange with your spouse or whoever's in your home that it's a fake note, right? They can't believe that it's a real note. So there you go. And then if you wanted to take that a step further. If you're leaving your home for a short period of time, or, or maybe even an extended period of time, this is really more for the extended period of time, do what's called a, a pre-ransack. So take some things, you know, take some items out of your yeah, out of your drawers, you know, messy up your place. So sort of like what's in this image. In this image, this is exactly the level of stuff we're going for. Stuff that's easy to clean up in less than five minutes. But it shows that the house has been ransacked already, right? That way, if somebody breaks into your house, right, or breaks into your room, and they see, oh, well, hey, this place has already been broken into and left. Um, I got to get out of here because they've already cleaned this place out. They're just going to leave not knowing that you ransacked your own place and all the valuables are hidden away. And you know things like that. Also, for law enforcement, if you know some kind of illegal law enforcement actions going on, and they're trying to arrest you for not wearing a mask or, you know, something like that, and they serve a warrant, you know, they do a bench warrant for you for not wearing a mask somewhere, and then they try to show up to serve the warrant on you, they're going to come into your house and they're going to see, oh, well, this place has been ransacked. So it's going to raise questions with them, right? And it's going to serve to misdirect, right? Um, so once again, this is this is this may be going a bit overboard, um, especially considering you're not likely to leave a window or door open, as in this image. Uh, you're going to leave your place locked up tight, but the inside's going to be ransacked. You know what's that about? So anybody that thinks about it for a minute is going to be you know going to be able to sort of pick it apart. But they're going to ha always have that in the back of their mind, like what the hey, you know what's going on, what's going on. You know, this is kind of a weird scenario. So. Um, that's something to think about that I have not seen anybody else talk about, despite the fact that it's not that hard to arrive at this logical conclusion, even if you don't have experience doing this stuff. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to bring that to your attention to think about. You know, that's all we're talking about, it's just things to think about, sort of the theme here. And here we arrive at the social considerations, right? Um, and you know, I said it before, but here it is again: is our, our goal is to fly lower on the radar and not is not to become invisible, right? If you're trying to hide from the government, from even from your local police department, you're going to fail, you know, long term because this is where we get into the territory of quote unquote harboring fugitives, right? We don't want to cross that line. We're not teaching people how to harbor fugitives because that sounds bad, you know. Somebody breaks out of prison and you harbor them, that's that's wrong. That's not good, right? We're talking about is if a tyrannical government decides to try to arrest you or take your children away from you or 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 harm you or even kill you in some way for not going with you know for being a political enemy that's what we're worried about right or not worried but more like concerned um, so you have to remember that this is strictly in the territory now of you know harboring fugitives which is a crime and we of course say not to do this is not good don't do this um, and when it comes to harboring fugitives, let's keep in mind that law enforcement is very, very, very good at their job when it comes to this. Um, the first thing they do is if you know a prisoner breaks out of prison, they go shake the tree. It's you know it's called shaking the tree, which is go hit up all of their relatives, <laughs> you know, because usually it, usually you'll find them at mama's house. You know, if somebody breaks out of prison, usually you'll find them there or at their brother's restaurant or their you know cousin's auto dealership or something like that. You'll find them there. Go find the places. You know, you'll you'll never be able to shake it. And that's what goes into the next one is the never free effect. Once you make the decision 
to go into hiding, you're never going to be free unless something changes, right? Once you make the decision to install a hidden bar or a speakeasy in your, you know, home during prohibition, you're never going to be free until prohibition is over. Likewise, if you try to hide Jews in your house and, you know, uh, Poland in 1940, 1939, 1940. Guess what? You're not going to be able to to be free unless you until the war's over. So, and then here's just another note to remind people that you know going on the lamb is difficult for everyone, um, impossible for most people, and completely impossible for anyone to do comfortably for a long period of time. So that's just something to keep in mind is that, you know, hey, we're talking about sort of, you know, becoming a fugitive. And that's not the sort of thing that we're trying to say, um, but that is how law enforcement will look at it. And I'm, I'm sure this video will probably get flagged because of that. But um, we just wanted to mention it, you know, that once again, you know, we're not talking about advocating for harboring fugitives. We're talking about, uh, you know, a theoretical thing. So... You know, moving on to some more social considerations is your neighbors, right? Your neighbors, they are your number one risk to security and detection. That's just it. They're, your neighbors are your number one risk. And this is kind of the idea why, which we have written on the slide here, which is, you know, social conditioning and the normalization of cognitive dissonance to report nor violators of norms and mores. Basically, that's a, a fancy way with big words, a way of saying that, um, most people in America, or maybe not most people, but a lot, a, a very large portion of society has been socially conditioned by the government and by social, by corporations and by social groups. They've been socially conditioned to report violators of norms and mores. Basically, you know, we've known this for years, you know, you, the concept of the Karen, right? Everybody knows the Karen, the certain haircut and that I want to speak to the manager attitude, well, guess what? It, it, it's all cute when it's a meme, but it's not cute when that Karen is turning in Anne Frank, right? So you have to remember that your neighbors, um, they're not necessarily your friends. You also have to keep in mind that, hey, if you're going to you know, build this sort of thing and live in a secret area, you've got to do it quietly. You've got to have you know, hammers and nails that are padded. You, know, you can't wear shoes. No air conditioning that, that will run and give your signature away. And nothing, no food that's, that has a good you know, odor that you can smell it from miles away. Um, you, know, you, you can play music to cover up sounds and things like that, but once again, that's... you know. It's very, very risky. Basically, you're not going to be able to use any power tools to construct this type of thing if you're constructing it in an area which is already beyond um, all help, right? And then you also have to remember, you know, so many people, especially in like the prepping type community, ignore the fact that children exist, <laughs> right? You know, me personally, I, you know, I don't have kids, but um, I have, you know, people at the Estee Underground Project do have kids, and I am prepared to take them in if I have to, seamlessly. So, you know, you're going to, you know, in, so in my emergency kits, guess what? I've got, you know, a couple stuffed animals, some, some children's toys for various ages and things like that. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a creepy thing to do. It's like, look, hey, look, you know, I'm prepared to to, you know, psychologically and, and, you know, emotionally support a kid if I had to, you know, me and my wife here, um, if we had to, because, you know, we have people who, who are important to us in our lives, they also have kids, and we need to be able to, to take care of them if something happens to their parents, so there's that, and then, you know, moving along with that concept into, you know, adults or, or even older children is, you know, entertainment and communication, so entertainment is definitely a thing. I don't know why people sort of gloss over that, but some form of entertainment is, is absolutely crucial when it comes to long term. We're talking, you know, we're not just talking, hey, buy a pack of cards and, you know, a board game for a hurricane, you know, that might last a few days or so without power. Um, we're talking about months here. We're talking about maybe years. You know, you might not be able to go to a park for years. You might not be able to go to school for years, right? And, you know, that, of course, that may be an over-dramatization of the situation, but we want to be prepared for that nonetheless. 
And, you know, once again, I've already mentioned the sort of Anne Frank example, but we wanted to, to mention this aspect, um, which is Godwin's Law. And this is the, um, the phenomenon that happens on the Internet. And, you know, this is why a lot of people have become sort of desensitized to what happened with the Holocaust. And that is that... Godwin's law states that you know the 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 longer a discussion happens on the internet, the likelihood of some sort of reference to the Nazis comes up, right? And we can talk about this in a separate video, this exact law. But we want to mention that, you know, that's why we've said previously that we think that people who reference the Nazis without a, a concrete example are sort of lazy because it's easy to reference the Nazis and just say, ah, Nazi bad, you're kind of authoritarian, you're kind of, you sort of meet a general stereotype of what Nazis are, so therefore you must be a Nazi, end of story. That's lazy to us, which is why we try to mention specific things. And even within this topic, we ourselves over the you know past hour or so have mentioned Anne Frank, and this is kind of a, the reason that we mention Anne, you know, Anne Frank is because of the fact that you know the Anne Frank House, which is where we got this information from for the slide, uh, their website and, and the whole their whole story is very, very, very well documented. Right? There are other cases, but there are not so many good visual cases, right? So I highly suggest you check out the Anne Frank House, especially the, the timeline page, because the timeline page shows uh, what they were thinking when they first occupied the secret annex. That is definitely a rabbit hole you should go down. You will, you could spend you know a couple of hours on that website and just be drawn in because all of the things on the website are very very well done. So you can take also a 3D virtual tour of the house and and things like that and go through all the rooms and such. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's definitely worth going into, especially if you're a lover of history like myself. But you know, to digress on that a little bit, you know, further, um, it's definitely worth researching because it shows, you know, once again the the mentality that went into occupying that location in the first place. So, you know, I know we've talked about a lot of things, and you, we haven't really made any specific recommendations. Basically, if we were to get a recommendation, it would be this right here, this slide. If you're gonna do it. Do a little bit of everything, right? That's the sort of thing we're talking about. I'm saying don't go out and buy, you know, spend two hundred dollars on you know these, you know, like this Del Monte can of uh, you know diversion safe. You know, don't go out and just buy you know, fifteen fake vents to put in your house. You know, yeah, sure, go out and buy, or even you can make a lot of this stuff honestly for cheap and for pretty much for free. In a lot of cases, you can make this stuff. But, you know, if you're going to do that, don't just put all your eggs in one basket, right? Diversification is the name of the game, not just with investing money, but with also investing in your secret places. So, um, you know, spreading things out, you know, being able to hide things in your home. I, you know, gosh, I can't even, I can't even begin to express, you know, how, many, how much hidden stuff I have in my house. You know, if you were to walk into my home, you would never think that I'm a gun owner. You would never think that I'm a ham radio operator. You would never think that I have anything to do with uh, that. I have any experience in you know outdoor survival. You would never think I you you would honestly walk into my house and think yeah there's some kind of yuppie urbanite lives here, and then you'd walk out and you'd never know that you know you know I've got an extensive ham radio collection I've you know got a lot of firearms and firearms training and did firearm instruction for a long time so I've got all that you know hidden away and stuff but you'd never know it because it's it's carefully hidden away so that's basically what we're going for here and here's a good place for more uh, information you know like I said we're talking about you know a lot of the stuff involves a sort of criminal element in society so Unfortunately um, for us, a lot of people within the law enforcement community are not so good at OPSEC. So you can go on, you know, YouTube and look at, you know, secret compartments that police have found. You can go on forums online and, and, and all kinds of things, and they'll tell you exactly where they found things. You know, we don't have the benefit of talking to criminals to find out 
hey, you know, where did you hide X, Y, Z? Because, oh, I'd like to do that. They're not going to tell you, for one. So basically, the people that get caught are the only people that we... It's a skewed sample size, right? So we're really only analyzing the people that get caught. And you know, once again, this is not to put down law enforcement in any way whatsoever. You know, I think that the sort of anti-law enforcement sentiment nowadays has kind of gone out of control. Um, and that's not what this video is about. We're not talking about evading law enforcement. We're not talking about hiding things from law enforcement. You know, we're not talking about, you know, committing crimes and things like that and using this knowledge for, for crimes. We're not talking about that at all. Um, what we're talking about is, is dual use information, right? So the same information, the same actions that, you know, people took in Rwanda to hide, you know, Tutsi relatives, guess what? It's the same tactics, techniques, and procedures that drug, you know, narco dealers and stuff like that are using to hide narcotics. You know, hiding a person in your in your attic because they are a political enemy of the state, you know, is a is a perfectly justifiable thing, right? But hiding a person in your attic because you're trying to avoid them getting deported or avoid them getting arrested or something like that that's not okay right so you can see the the same action right of hiding a person in your home can either be the most noble thing a person can do or it can be you know a, a crime not worthy of mention so just keep that in mind that, you know once again we're talking about this dual use information is that that's why we were kind of hesitant to talk about it but then certain events happened that made us want like yeah we're, we're gonna we're gonna dance this line here and talk about this information because nothing that we've said today is illegal in any form or fashion this is simply knowledge right um, nothing is this is none of this is classified none of this is proprietary none of this is illegal all of this information comes from these sources. Examples of, you know, once again, that we, we talked about from the other slide of these historical case examples. So if you'd like to learn more, go check out these topics because, I, you know, if once you start digging down, you'll go down a rabbit hole. And anytime you go down a rabbit hole when learning something is a good day, right? So that's something to uh, research further. And if you'd like to support us, um, make sure to check out our website. Uh, the link will be posted in the description below. Um, we have our, our most updated communications plan. We've got a few blog posts. Um, and we also have the uh, link to our podcast. And if you're joining us on YouTube for the first time, we've had a podcast for a very long time. And if you like this sort of content, uh, we tend to bring the sort of a, a more analytical um, aspect to our podcast, right? So it's not necessarily so much about this prepper survivalist content we sort of save that for youtube but if you're looking for more analytical content go to our podcast and that's where you'll find it and also if you're looking to support us check our store our uh, storefront out on teespring this is um, where we sort of uh, get all of our funding from we used to have a, uh, a patreon page so if you listen to our earlier podcasts um, we used to have that up and running but then we decided that we didn't want people to uh, give us money just for given us money's sake we wanted you to be able to actually get something in return so we've set up a few products that have our logo on them on teespring you order it the money goes to us we make a very very small profit on each other of each of the items we've literally listed each item for as low as it can go as low as teespring will allow us to do so uh, almost all of your money goes into actually making and printing the item itself and then it ships out to you whenever they're done printing it, and we get a very, very small, I think it's like a 2% return on each item sold, depending on what it is. And uh, we put that money directly into the bandwidth hosting for our podcast, which we have to pay for. Our podcast isn't free, so that's how we are able to fund it. And, you know, just in case people were asking, because people are asking a lot of times, like, you know, hey, how can I help out? If you're, you know, trying to help us out and help us grow, um, that helps us out a lot because we're limited in the number of podcasts we can put out per month. Uh, the number of hours that we can put out is, is, a, is a very much limited by budget. So if you want to see more podcasts, uh, buy some more stuff from our Teespring store and that will help us out a lot. So once again, I hope that this uh, episode hasn't been uh, too much of a downer. I hope that it's been inspirational and informative. And, you know, it's a very hard topic to talk about in a positive light, but I hope that it, it has been a sort of positive thing. We don't need to be so negative, you know, all the time, because I think that a lot of times, you know, you hop on YouTube, hop on a podcast, or you know, hop on any social media nowadays, 
think you've got a lot of people on there that are, you know, not very positive about things. So um, we're choosing to kind of, you know, be a little bit more positive, even though we're talking about a topic that is very much uh, a scary thing to think about. So um, hopefully that, that that sort of helps somebody out. Uh, even if we only help one person, this was definitely worth putting together. Um, also, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please, please, please comment. Uh, please like the video if you like it and subscribe to our channel for more. I know we uh, we keep saying that, and you probably hear that on every YouTube video you you uh, watch, and that's because the algorithms uh, that YouTube has make it hard to see videos that don't get a lot of likes and comments. So even if you don't really have much to say, drop us a comment, and uh, it helps us out a lot. That increases our visibility. Increased visibility means more viewers, more viewers means more content, and the cycle continues on. So until that cycle continues on, we will see you next time. And always remember, fight in the shade is to actual out.